everyone today. As you just heard, we're going to be recording this and we'll have it up on our website um, in the coming days. Let me share my screen. Just a reminder, I'm Zach Feldman. Um, I'm the manager of the data science and analytics team that produces the small area forecast. Um, Joffrey Capella is on, on the call today too, and he's our uh, senior planner in the data science and analytics. And then Andy Taylor, the manager of uh, regional planning and analytics um, is here as well. Today is, is really gonna be kind of a, a review of the last year and a, and a staging for what we would like to accomplish next year. So part of what we're gonna do is discuss what our plans are looking like in terms of what we've got scheduled, what we'd like to get accomplished, particularly in the first two quarters of next year. Um, and then we're gonna to go to some uh, survey questions and try to have some discussions around what the working group would like us to focus on, where we can um, really bring value to um, the small air forecast for local jurisdictions. So just a quick review of prior meetings. Back in April was our first meeting. Um, we went around, introduced Dr. Cogstaff, uh, we also introduced, um, allowed folks to have um, introduced themselves and um, which jurisdiction they were representing and, and what their position or role um, at that jurisdiction was. Um, and we gave a, a broad outline of the small area forecast process. So what some of the data inputs are, um, who we're working with in terms of consultants, um, how we um, determine some of the um, choice models within um, the, the, the model itself, um, those kind of broader big picture look at, at what it is we do to produce this forecast, including the um, review process. The meeting in June, we um, preliminary forecast from the state demography office had been released or were soon to be released so we talked a little bit about how um, those uh, demography office forecasts um, play into the small area forecasts that we produce. That, um, we use those at the county level to constrain our model. Um, we also talked about our scenario work for the GHG uh, mitigation, and that led us down a path of uh, potentially moving away from strict state demography office controls if, if, we, if we have data to indicate the next couple of years may veer away from that um, forecast. At our most recent meeting in September, we discussed some model updates that we're working on. So we, we had been um, adjusting the data to kind of deal with some vacancy issues we see in the model where there aren't enough households to reasonably fill the residential units that are being placed and um, continued work on stratifying the control totals to better match the demog um, de demographics that we expect in the region in 2030, 2040, 2050, that if we don't do some work to um, correct those, we end up with population, the numbers that, that don't fit with what's expected. We also end up with too, too many kids, not enough older adults, um, household makeups won't look correct. So we're continuing to work in that direction. And we also had a deep dive into the housing employment capacity estimation process um, that we use to um, assign a housing unit and employment capacity for each um, census block. Um, the key there is that that's, those are some of our biggest levers, um, being able to zero out capacity or being able to increase or decrease capacity, um, both at the block level and at the zoning level 
um, those are some of our most powerful levers. So hopefully that um, will help everyone speak the same language when it gets to the review process. Wanted to also throw back up our goals for this working group. These were goals that we developed um, before the working group started to kind of give it some direction. Um, a lot of what the discussion in the second half today will focus on is what are the goals that the working group sees as, as adding the most value and, and hopefully we can update these goals to better represent that. Uh, to also give you um, just a sense of where we're headed next year, um, just on some milestones of the work we have in front of us at Dr. Cog, um, but also to help inform our discussion about what our priorities need to be as a, a, a working group. Um, what we have coming up uh, early next year into the spring, um, we are incorporating several model updates. Uh, Zach has talked a, a bit about um, the process to update zoning, and so we're, we're actually doing that currently, um, implementing several choice model improvements, uh, different segmentation of our choice models, um, and also uh, just different configurations uh, for, for how we've estimated and calibrated that. So some major improvements there. Uh, but what we expect, as Zach has described a bit, is better stratification of our control totals will help some of the demographics that we output, which is a big deal for um, our travel model. Uh, and then also just incorporating some better data sets uh, for really what's in the pipeline, what's in the development pipeline with CoStar, Zonda, to just make sure that we're things that our model may not pick up on, but we can see through these data sets, through improvements on the ground, that there are investments taking place and trying to get those in some of our near years um, of our simulation. Um, we're also uh, trying to figure out and wrestle with um, what, what potentially is a, a big change for us, but hopefully will be somewhat minor of an adjustment to what the state demography office is putting out for control totals, um, just as we work through what data they're looking at about um, vacancy rates by county and household size and, and how some of these things are affecting what we're having to put in up front. And so that's going to be a, a big point for us. Um, where, where we're trying to figure out how we continue to coordinate, uh, but where we may need to make some, some adjustments based on the data that we're seeing on the ground, especially through uh, this CoStar and Zonda uh, schedule development. Um, so that's kind of what, uh, that's the technical part of what we're doing at Dr. Cog, but really one of the biggest pieces that we need um, are reviews of, of the preliminary forecast that we're, we're putting out. So. We do some internal review to really do that quality control, checking what we're seeing, um, making some, some changes and improvements uh, as just as some of these data gremlins don't show up until we're actually um, putting the model through its paces. Uh, but I think even more important is getting that jurisdiction review. So for folks who were part of this process in 2020, um, we wanna do something similar, but it could be something um, that's an improved process based on uh, really what's the most effective way to get your feedback on really where what pieces we may be getting wrong, what pieces uh, we may need to adjust in terms of zoning, um, especially in terms of places where um, plans may be overriding what the current zoning says. And so there's a lot of, uh, of room here, even if you're, you're hearing things, seeing things, more recent approvals, uh, more recent zoning changes that you want to see reflected. Um, this is a, a great opportunity for that and really something we can't replicate no matter how improved uh, modeling process uh, we have. We, so that's a big piece for us. It's just making sure we're establishing the foundation for that dialogue. Um, the, the piece here, the ultimate deliverable out of this is that we would be sharing this, this finalized forecast on our regional data catalog. Uh, the last time we went through this, this was in, immediately integrated into a regional transportation plan and that update. Um, that Right now, we've been kind of in this cycle where we've either had to be doing some scenario work for the regional transportation uh, process or completing a forecast 
for the regional transportation plan or an update or amendment as we did last year or earlier this year. And so we are trying to get ahead of some of this. Typically um, uh, at Dr. Cog, um, we're asked to update or amend uh, the regional transportation plan. Um, it, it used to be more frequent, but, but now it, it's getting down to maybe every other year, still sometimes every year. It's really dependent on what projects I need to be represented in that plan. But we wanna make sure that we're ready to go before that amendment process starts. So we're trying to establish a rhythm of putting together a forecast and getting that local input long before it's really needed for that amendment process, really focused on evaluating projects themselves. Really by the time we hear that that amendment process is gonna be needed, it's really too late for us to have a really good and thorough vetting process for our forecast. So this is a new rhythm we're trying to develop here. Um, we're still trying to figure out um, how often it's gonna be, if it's every other year, um, how to get stay and stay on cycle when we do need a regional transportation plan update as well. So um, that's a bit about where we're headed and, and what that will result in. Um, so hopefully with this look back, and look at these milestones. Um, that gives some uh, foundation for um, really uh, what we hope is a discussion uh, through some, some questions that I think Joffrey will be going through here. And I'll just quickly add that a lot of these bullet points in the incorporate model updates, these could lead to some pretty significant changes in the forecast. So stratified control totals will stratify by household type and age of head. Our choice models are now stratified by um, age of head and income and presence of children. So the two of those combined could lead to a lot of differences. The um, schedule development based on our subscription services could, could lead to a lot of changes. So we will need a lot of help to vet this, but we are also preserving prior feedback. So if, if somebody told us that a certain zoning type, if we're overbuilding that and we ratcheted down that individual zoning type, we still have that in our system. It's still gonna be um, taken into account. If somebody told us that certain census um, blocks or TAZs or block groups are are built out in terms of what they plan on, um, we were able to make adjustments to that. Those will all still be in there. So I think we're gonna need a lot of feedback, but I'm also hopeful that we can preserve um, and not kind of reinvent the wheel in terms of the entire feedback process that we can kind of start from maybe halfway um, if we kind of consider the last time a full push. Does anyone have any questions or comments or concerns or anything they'd like to discuss in terms of what we've got broadly mapped out for the next couple quarters? Okay, let's jump to um, some survey questions that will hopefully um, drive some conversation that will help us and help the working group um, be productive. So you can either go to menti.com and put in this number, um, or um, you can use the QR code on the right. Great, thank you very much, Zach. Um, I did just, uh, as, as I'm giving a brief introduction to our interactive portion of the, of the meeting here, um, go ahead and navigate to menti.com um, and then the eight digit code there, you'll wanna enter that in to join the presentation. We'll have six slides and six, six, pre uh, six presentation questions. Um, that we'll want to get, most of them are open-ended, but we're going to get a sense of the, um, we'll go over 
topics that we have covered in the past three meetings this year, um, and then also where where we're wanting to go, where where you individually, collectively uh, think we should be going, as well as uh, getting a sense of what topics were um, of value that you found to be of value. So I'll go ahead and um, is everyone in the presentation? Okay, great. So the first question there, many of you are, think you are already providing input. Um, I'll have are you able to share that that screen? Yeah. Um, so folks can see the. Oops. Oh, my goodness. OK, um, I trust that uh, I, I'm sharing the screen now. Um, and the question there is, how have you used the current small area forecast and how you anticipate using the forecast in the future? And we're getting a lot of feedback here and comments. Thank you. Go ahead and pause scrolling when we get to the top. Okay, um, let's go through. Oh goodness. Press enter. Okay, so sorry, I'm figuring out where to press enter to, to pause scrolling here. Um, so to cover a few of these on the on the fly here. Um, from the top left, help coordinate land use decisions. Um, uh, the third one on the left, um, have not used it in the past, but could see it being informative for future land use map modifications, grant applications, or project justifications. So great to see that there's some possibilities for future use there. I'm loving the honesty on the the, the middle column here. Um, of folks not using um, uh, Dr. Cox's forecast, um, not comfortable with some of the assumptions that we're making, um, and, and how that this is totally fair. We're under um, some parameters for what we have to consider uh, in our forecasting process, and it may look different uh, for you locally. And so, I think that's. Uh, really important for us to hear and try and uh, I don't know if we can reach total consensus on that, but if there's any way we can uh, find ways to move uh, in the right direction to try and create a shared understanding of the future. Um, I, I, I just want to say thank you to whoever put that in. Yeah, and there's another one on the middle of the right. I think it's um, really helpful to know that there are kind of some very broad um, disconnects um, with the assumptions we're making and, and the way our forecast is looking. So finding out where those disconnects are can be really helpful for us. Um, it could also be that we really need to start thinking about this as a different product that um, it, it maybe we can start thinking about the smaller forecast in terms of high and low and and um, breaking up the region into areas so that we could um, provide guidance given our data and modeling that isn't always constrained um, like it needs to be for the RTP. If, um... Rolling will help us see a few more of these. Um, on that initial screen, we did have about nine showing. And I was estimating maybe five indicated that you have not used the forecast in the past. And so maybe just a rough estimate that maybe 50-50 responses or have not used it in the past or close to 50% haven't used it in the past. Um, so maybe we'll want to 
are there any, uh, is, does anyone want to provide any additional context to the response here? Sorry, uh, David, I, I, I think there's an audio issue. Ambitious, but considering we gave the coaching staff a $7 million pool, I would expect a commensurate amount of experience with that. And we still have a lot of. Um, David, I, I think we, we do have a pretty significant audio uh, issue. Sorry, David. Uh, I, I just muted you. Unfortunately, I think there's a problem with your audio, um, and it's kind of coming through garbled on our end. Unfortunately, um, I can unmute you now and see if that um, if it's fixed. Can you hear us? Well, maybe we'll come back to, to David when we get some improved audio. Um, in my looking at this list, I, I, as Joffrey mentioned, I see kind of a, a large contingent that is using it for uh, planning and land use discussions, a contingent that hasn't used it, and then um, not insignificant group that have not used it specifically because they have issues with our forecast. And that group in particular, those that have not used it because they see problems with our assumptions or um, the final forecast. Um, if you're comfortable, I'd really like you to email us or, or um, let us know um, at some point who you are so that we can really kind of focus in on how we can improve um, this forecast um, because obviously the, the, the pain points are where we can make the biggest changes. <laughs> um, there's big areas where the forecast seems to work pretty well. The model, um, kind of just runs on its own and there's other areas that need a lot more handholding. So finding out where those are is really important. Great. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Zach. And, and if there is anyone else who would like to provide a little bit more context, maybe um, someone who hasn't used it in the past, um, if you feel comfortable um, speaking up in this setting um, as to why you haven't, your, your jurisdiction or your team hasn't used it in the past, before we move on to the next question. Have something good in the, the chat here about um, potentially a, a systemic issue we have with infill and redevelopment areas, not necessarily reflecting local or, or longer range planning. Um, yeah, I think that is something we are trying to improve this cycle. And so I, I, we definitely want to get more feedback on that uh, specifically. I think this is part of the balance we're trying to take uh, with how we're looking at um, some of the, the master plan communities in our region, but also recognizing that there are significant infill opportunities in this region. So uh, we have limited amount of control total to work with. And so that is um, hard balance for us. Yeah, and, and additionally, a lot, of the, a lot of the changes we're making to the stratification of the choice models and the stratification of the control totals we're hopeful will, will help with some of those infill and redevelopment areas that our, our models forecast 
different location choices for different household types. And we're hopeful that that will um, push things into these areas for infill a little bit better. Great. Um, thank you for the um, additional context there, Aaron, um, and, and your comments, um, Andy and Zach. We will move on to the second question here. Um, um, um move on um. all right the next slide there sorry about that and I'm going to Share my screen again. Okay, the um, what topics from the small area forecast working group meetings this year have provided the most value? Um, and that's a ranking from generally a low value to a high value. Introduction of jurisdiction representatives, small area forecast process overview, state demography office forecast and the small area forecast, GHG mitigation scenarios, deviation from the, the state demography office forecast, model updates for the small area forecast, and the deep dive into housing and employment capacity. And you may notice that's a scale of one to five. All right, the uh, voting looks to be leveling off. Uh, feel free, of course, to uh, finish entering in your, your values here, your responses. Um, probably just going high, the higher value, the higher value topics to medium to lower. Um, the small area forecast model updates. Um, it's more of a, more of a, the, the fifth, sixth, and seventh are more in a, a bit more in a technical range, I would say, technical topics, certainly the model updates, the deep dive in the previous meeting to housing and employment capacity. Um, of course, these numbers are shifting, the responses are shifting, and then the deviation from the SDO's uh, forecast. Um, granted, those are just a little bit higher than the, uh, the process overview and the um, SDO forecast and the small area forecast. Um, certainly seeing a lower lower value to the introduction of jurisdiction representatives. Anyone want to provide any um, rationale for how they rated some uh, some of these topics? Hey, uh, Phil Kleisler with the City of Lafayette. Um, I, I, I put a housing and employment capacity deep dive as a higher one. Um, there was also, y'all had the um, agree to kind of chat offline about that because we were looking at our um, employment and housing. And so I found that the timing was really helpful. And so learning about your process while we were internally doing ours was, was super useful and hopefully we'll get some alignment on the two. Great. Thank you, Phil.
Uh, anyone want to speak to uh, the topic they found to be the most helpful, the most useful? Um, and okay, seeing, uh, seeing, hearing the uh, no, <laughs> no responses here. We'll move on to the next slide. What topics would you like to see the small area forecast working group cover next year? This is an, another open-ended response. Okay, thank you. Comments are coming in, responses are coming in. Um, the the sixth, uh, the on the third column there, the second one, how to best collaborate between Dr. Cog and local agencies on the forecasting process. Um, so whoever responded with that, um, if you feel comfortable, is there any early thoughts on uh, how best to collaborate um, or, or good ways that uh, you may see to be effective and how we may collaborate better? It's me, uh, Julian Liu, is for City of Aurora. Uh, so we, in the past, uh, uh, you know, worked with Dr. Cog a lot on the uh, uh, Small area projections and your forecastings, and uh, there are many situations where very specific local uh, knowledge and input uh, would make a difference in terms of the final outcome of the forecast. So, if there's a way I understand that model, you know, as you, you push the button, it goes, and there are so many parameters, so many factors. Uh, uh, built into the model, but uh, then there's local knowledge and specifics on these uh, specific parcel or TAZ. If so, if if there's a a better iterative process, uh, so there's maybe provide a, a plan of time for the locals to uh, to provide input and, and feedback. So I think that'll be be able to, will, will help to pro provide a better. Uh, outcome for both the locals and the Dr. Carr. Yeah, I, 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 and I think in a lot of ways, we're hopeful that we can get into a rhythm of, of updating the forecast more often, and then it provides more opportunities for our local jurisdictions to provide feedback. Um, the way we have it kind of planned now is that this working group is really the venue for process improvements. So if, if a jurisdiction has um, suggestions and, and collaboration in terms of how we can make that process of feedback or make that process of modeling work better, we kind of envision that this working group is that venue and that um, when it then is, when a preliminary forecast is provided to the jurisdiction, that that's a, an opportunity for kind of the um, nitty gritty looking um, down into the census block level in terms of what we're forecasting or what we have 
established kind of currently on the ground? Yeah, I'm just thinking uh, the, 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 the feedbacks provided by the, the, the local agencies is kind of a, a, a must in terms of your, maybe it has to be, it would be best if this that step can be somehow built into the, the forecasting process, understand your oversight under, under time constraint. But uh, it just, because things change daily. <laughs> So even you 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 develop a perfect process in terms in the modeling uh, uh, pers from the modeling perspective, you still need this this manual check to 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 make it uh, to as a reality check. That would be my thought. Um, I would add on to that, Andy and Zachary. We met for what hour hour and a half last week and talked about Bennett and all the things that have been happening in Bennett that a lot of people don't know about because a lot of the data sources don't reflect those. I'm optimistic that your use of Zonda as you described it is gonna be helpful in the way you are able to track development and even tracking satellite images and seeing where ground is being disturbed and um, that's an indicator of development. But I would um, um, just reinforce that, that, that value of the one-on-one -on -one because I, I hope it was um, 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 productive for you and beneficial um, to talk. And, and I, it, it's time consuming. If we took an hour and a half on Bennett, um, um, it, it's, it's not gonna be easy, but I do think that's really important. I agree with you on. Yeah, and, and the one-on-one -on -one meetings have been really, really helpful. And actually one of the later questions is, what would you guys like to meet at on one on one? Because the one on one meetings have been some of the most helpful. Yeah, I, I concur. Um, I do want to um, thanks, thanks, Steve. And, and um, two of the eight responses here, I think there's eight, are kind of in the neighborhood of um, how is actual development. Um, line up with projected forecasts, uh, the middle one there, how is baseline current condition figures, uh, how can they be adjusted to reflect what's on the ground today? Um, it, it, either one of the those who did respond in, with these um, want to elaborate. Uh, certainly, I think we all understand the, uh, the thrust of the responses, but um, you want, it, does anyone want to care, uh, care to elaborate on either one of these responses? Um, and and maybe hearing silence. That's a maybe a, a, a um, suggestion to move on. Um, Zonda was mentioned as one of the, the data tools that we have for uh, really the single family detached product, um, as Steve noted out in Bennett, um, and that's a new tool. Certainly a, a great new data resource that we have that we did not have uh, three years ago um, to also. Um, go along with CoStar, which we have used in the past. Um, and then I do want to point out, I think, call it the sixth and seventh um, responses here, ad address how has the forecast been used or allude to something like how has the forecast been used. So we'll, um, I'm glad these, these two responses were noted. We will um, address that in a future um, slide here. I'm um, going to move on to the next slide. Well, well Jeff, I'll just mention how the forecasts have been used is an interesting topic for us because I think it might give you a chance to hear from someone other than um, Zach or myself or Joffrey. So, uh, I, yeah, I think that's a compelling topic too. Thanks for the feedback. Great. And um, part of what Andy just said is, is really the thrust of this um, question. Um, as a statement, this is a shared forecast. How do we ensure broad input and ownership of a small area forecast?
The second comment there reinforces uh, previous discussion on uh, regular check-ins, one-on-one check-ins. Um, three out of five, I think, uh, if not four out of five, are addressing one-on-one uh, -on -one discussions with jurisdictions. All right, many of these comments are in the neighborhood of making sure we're, we are paying attention to the input that is being provided. It's coming from uh, local jurisdictions, local planning staff, um, and uh, I think the, the one that's scrolling up there, except the input of local planners um, on reasons why metro-wide assumptions may not, do not work for certain communities. So. Um, yeah, I'm kind of following from the last slide. A lot of this is kind of coalescing in, for me into the, that we're clearly, we've got a blind spot in terms of um, providing feedback. I think a lot of times we ask for, so providing feedback from Dr. Cog to the jurisdictions on kind of our process and where we are at any given point and how things are being incorporated. Um, I think we ask for feedback in terms of reviewing the forecast. We get local zoning data every year. And I think we spend so much time processing that that we get very much in the weeds and forget that this whole process is very much black box for anybody outside of the building. And that we, we are not probably anywhere close to often enough um, providing um, an update back out in terms of where we are in the process, uh, what we've done with specific comments, um, particularly when uh, we'll be looking at three years since the <laughs> last forecast by the time this one's completed, uh, that it, when it gets to be that long a time scale, it really needs some interim um, updates. Um, so hopefully this working group can help us determine what that, um, what that should look like. Well, and I think one of the big improvements we hope to make is we've been putting um, some agency resources into building a better uh, uh, customer relationship management system or CRM. Some folks might have something like that, places they've worked or currently work, but it's something we've never fully implemented uh, here at Dr. Cog and just as a better way uh, of capturing these conversations and making sure that um, we're following through on, on some of these pieces here and that this knowledge isn't just sitting with, um, you know, the handful of people that might have been on that call. Um, we're, we're excited about uh, trying to make investments there and not just um, as cool as the model improvements are that we're also um, making sure we have better ways to handle that information. Yeah, I just want to emphasize that, um, you know, for, for City of Aurora, we do need this small area land use forecasting uh, for a number of uh, uses, such as raw water, they always rely on this for their capital improvement projects planning effort. Uh, obviously, transportation is another uh, area we rely on this a lot. And we uh, we develop a, a kind of a, a separate system for the city of Aurora. And I think we are also trying to do another one. There's a ongoing project. So if there is a regional uh, a small area model that we and all use, that would be the best. So we don't have to, each jurisdiction doesn't have to spend the money and maintain a separate model. 
So if there's a way somehow, uh, yes, you're talking about the ownership or the usage is that this regional forecasting smaller for us forecasting tool or model are, are can truly be considered as part of the, you know, uh, uh, being useful and uh, can be uh, taking the ownership by the locals, that would be the best. I think that that would be uh, really a, a very helpful tool for everybody. So it just, so there need, needs to be a way, I don't know exactly how <laughs> that can be done, but I think there just, there's a need and there'll be a great value for everybody in the region. Yeah, um, currently we subscribe to um, Urban Cement that runs the model for us. So we have licensing constraints, um, but that that is, uh, there are always kind of discussions on our end about, oh, should we be moving to something open source? Should we move it to another solution? Um, that, so that's another consideration that I think we hadn't really thought about that um, it can be it can be much more collaborative if we are not using a subscription um, service to kind of manage our model. That process wise, I think the thing we've always struggled with is that we've often invited a large set of comments all at one time. And then we've tried to integrate those all at one time. Uh, and it's hard to, the iterative thing is, is something that um, we want to think through with, with all of you, because when we do make changes in one part of the region, it can have changes in several other parts of the region. And so how do we recognize that part of this problem as well, that it's not just a, always just a one-on-one -on -one conversation and, and, uh, yeah, I think that's the struggle we've had uh, to be really transparent about it. And uh, one that I think doesn't preclude a more iterative process, um, but it, it definitely is a struggle that maybe we just need to, to build in extra steps um, if that would really be uh, worthwhile. Yeah, you know, one thought is that uh, when we had the model a couple of years ago, you know, we were kind of a took a top-down approach. So we have this, we divided by the city, the city uh, uh, into seven or eight sub-areas. So we have an expert panel to decide what is the percentage growth in the next 10 years or 20 years for each sub-area. So we kind of have a higher upper level control for the sub-areas because you, the, the more detail you go into, the less accuracy you have. So you lose your precision and accuracy. So we, we're trying to control the upper le uh, level, the higher level. So I'm, I, I don't know if there's a way in the regional model you can build into some control total for the city-wide or sub areas for the larger cities. Are we, you know, we, we maybe have a higher comfortable level, confidence level in terms of the accuracy of the model to reflect the local. Um, I find that to be a, a pretty an excellent uh, suggestion that uh, we can certainly, with a one-on-one -on -one discussion with Aurora, we can, um, See if that's something that we can entertain. Um, I, I before we move on to the next slide, I did want to touch on two different responses here. One was the top left. I like the idea of a regional review. Um, I can whoever did respond here. Do you feel comfortable expanding upon what you mean by a regional review? I I, I may interpret it a different way, or Andy or Zach may interpret it a different way. Oh uh, yeah, that was me. This is Aaron. Um, you know, I think sometimes what happens is there's these control totals and people's plans are, um, you know, once you add all of those up, it, it exceeds those control totals. And so I wonder if there's a way to look at this. I mean, obviously, ideally, we would all look at this together and talk through things, which is not feasible. And I, re I really appreciate the work you all do to sort of go and, and have these one-on-one -on -one conversations. But I wonder if there's a way um, 
you know, at a county level using those county control totals or just as a group to really talk through things because maybe there are some areas where um, it might facilitate, um, you know, agreement on certain, certain numbers fluctuating one way or the other based on um, sort of some of those conversations. Maybe that's too challenging, um, but just looking at it, I guess I maybe should have put in sub-regional, you know, county level or um, a collection of jurisdictions that, that have commonalities working together to take a look at more than just their own jurisdiction, um, but area where they might have, have some input on. Yeah, and I like that idea of kind of getting groups in the room that are kind of under that same kind of county control total. I think our feeling in the past was that those discussions could get um, kind of heated since everybody is kind of, um, it's, it's in the way we've modeled in the past, it's very much a zero sum, uh, make it difficult. So yeah, but hopefully, I, th I think that makes a lot of sense. There may be a way that we can, um, have these discussions at a larger level because it, it even gets difficult when um, the county and the city are saying different things um, or even developers. I mean, it, it can be, or consultants that we get kind of different answers across the board. So I, I think it does make sense to have a lot of people in the room together. Um, there also seems to be a disconnect between when this feedback is coming in for the review and how we then um, produce the finalized forecast. Um, and that may be something that the working group can help us kind of develop a new product that it really may be that we need to tie the comments and the feedback in some type of web map directly to the change uh, from the preliminary to the finals to help folks evaluate, are we understanding what this comment meant? Um, have we found all the places where it's going on? If someone tells us that a, a certain zoning type really can't go above five units an acre, are, are we catching um, that across the jurisdiction? Um, so it, it could be that we need to provide kind of some more advanced products to kind of push out um, how we're incorporating the comments and feedback. Yeah, and maybe that's a strategy, you know, not everyone sitting down at the beginning, but maybe once you get some of that input and can flag if there's conflicts or, you know, maybe it could help you all. Um, I'm, I'm guessing not every jurisdiction provides you feedback. Um, so maybe that could also be a mechanism to have folks talk about okay, we've gotten these, you know, three communities out of 10 to respond. Here's where we see some conflicts. Let's use that as a starting point and let's talk about maybe some of the areas that we didn't get feedback on and how local input could inform that. Yeah, and, and the GIS team here is able to put together a lot of web maps and story maps and um, different products, we may be able to kind of tag some of these um, TAZs and comments as being part of a whole, part of some type of sub-regional area so that they can kind of be evaluated together. So on that, on that note, I think one of the things that when we talked last week, you mentioned some of the TAZs are they're huge and they don't really reflect you know, kind of what's happening at the local level. Um, that's certainly true out on the I-70 corridor. And I wonder if it doesn't make sense at some point, and if you can reconfigure the boundaries of some of those. Yeah, so it's sort of, in a lot of ways, doesn't affect the small air forecast because we actually forecast at the census block level and we only aggregate up to the TAZs to give it to the travel model. And what we're leaning towards is that we just won't ask for feedback at the TAZ level. So it could be that in the more, more urban cores, we might be looking at block group and that in the out in the suburbs, we may be looking at 
even the block level. Um, so we may try to find some middle ground between census block and TAZ that is easier to evaluate. We don't want to put it too small because the fidelity of the model doesn't really work. We don't need to be moving one housing unit from one side of the street to the other. Uh, but it, it could be that, for example, census block, census block group may be a, a good level. Um, but yeah, we've had the same concern and, and the transportation team here is going to be doing some review of those boundaries, but I don't know that the changes they'll make will be sufficient to kind of fully capture what's going on around the region. So I suspect that, that we will not be asking for feedback at the TAZ level again, mostly for what you're describing. That they're too big, boundaries don't, don't match up well with the way the development is landing. Yeah, and I think I mean yeah, that, that that's not for this group to probably focus on, but I do I think that's a that's a challenge in of of the transportation model, right? I mean, if you're trying to determine you know the best place where, where traffic's going and maybe the best place for an interchange on I-70 and you have a TAC that you know is five or six miles long and five or six miles wide. Yeah, it doesn't does it doesn't give you that kind of fine grain that a tra transportation model should have. But maybe, but maybe that's not the purpose of the regional model. Maybe that's the purpose of, you know, local transportation plans. And then we try to convince you, Dr. Cog, that you know this is this is where the traffic's really going. Yeah, I think this is useful context for this conversation specifically because maybe we do need to be rethinking just simply the how we're reporting this out, that our, our zone's the right level to be reporting this stuff out to be of value locally. And in a lot of cases, it may not be. So do we need to rethink that? Maybe it's not a choice on one, but maybe, yeah, I, I think this is really helpful to think about right now. Well, in particular that the transportation and modeling team has very different requirements. Um, for what, for why they size the TAZs the way they do. Um, so if it's not breaking their model, I think they often <laughs> don't want to make too many tweaks since it can um, make the running of the model more difficult. Um, and we're not necessarily in our forecasting work beholden to those TAZs. So it may, it may make sense that we stop doing the feedback process in that way. And it'll also let us get feedback at a smaller scale and potentially pass that on to the transportation folks if we're seeing that the TAZs are really not working for certain jurisdictions that um, the development is just too lopsided within a TAZ. Um, we may be able to see that more easily. This is Larry. I wanted to concur with Steve. Uh, yeah, Arapahoe County, we have some of those very large zones and they tend to be where our greenfield development is likely to happen. So something, even going to the 2020 census tracks provides a bit more refinement than some of those huge TAZs. So I'd agree, we need to relook at uh, the reporting units. Um, great, thank you for the input and the discussion um, there. I, I wanted to, I think we have two more, um, to go through, but before we get to the next one, um, the lower right sends specific requests for data or input to attendees, provide follow up summary after meetings. Um, I, I'm pretty mo much of this response is quite clear. Um, who uh, the respondent on this one, do you, mm, do you care to or uh, do you feel comfortable providing a few examples of specific requests for data? that you may be thinking of, um, Zach, Andy, or I, certainly we kind of development data or zoning data, but um, if you feel comfortable, um, do you wanna provide a few examples of what you might um, for specific requests for data? Hi, this is uh, Alan Seeloff with City of Wheat Ridge. Yeah, I, I wrote that in um, mostly more of maybe just kind of a, a higher level orientation for me personally, frankly, of uh, you know, I haven't attended many of these meetings, so haven't 
I don't feel all that engaged necessarily. So when there's a request for how we use it or or what we can get out of it, um, I'm not sure what I've I'm supposed to be contributing per se, um, or maybe what the realm of some of the requests even are. So this is my maybe just more of kind of a high level overview. And I, I get the sense that maybe there's been other contacts within my jurisdiction. Um, maybe if there's multiple contacts going out that we need to get on the same page internally. And we we may not even know if if Dr. Cox reaching out to different people at different times. Um, thank you very much for the response. Um, yeah, no, that's that's great to uh, have clarification that that's a higher level um, comment. And uh, if you have not participated in the uh, three years ago, then certainly you, you're maybe blind to what um, you know what the process is or who who it provided input previously. Um, so certainly we'll want to. We do have you in our uh, customer our CRM system, and and you're on board, and so. Uh, you know, we hope to um, find some time to make a, a connection with you, a one-on-one -on -one meeting, if, if we can figure out a way to get that scheduled. So, um, and probably get you up to speed with some of the technical and non-technical nature of the um, forecast process. Um, great, thank you, yeah, Alan. And I would just say, um, Alan, it's a good point. I mean, there's so much turnover now and in the last year or so that it probably makes sense for us to provide um documentation and um, updates in terms of what we're doing outside of kind of those big update windows where we're updating the forecast because it's not reasonable for us to expect even folks that have been through the process before to have the bandwidth to kind of stay on top of all of this year over year over year i mean we're, we're doing this and even we kind of things kind of fall out of our heads year to year. So I, um, I think having a, um, an entry point for folks makes a lot of sense, whether um, that's some PowerPoint slides or some memos on, on how this all works. Um, I think that's a good point that, that it should be more intuitive and obvious uh, where to get that information. Uh, thank you, Zach, for that additional context uh, and response. Appreciate it. We're going to move on to, I think we have uh, about 10 more minutes. So I believe we have two more slides to go through. Um, how can we broaden the value of the small area forecast as a product beyond the transportation planning mandate? A few responses previously have touched on this. I'm happy to fill the dead air if we, we need a little time for folks to get some thoughts together. Um, the uh, uh, current mandate that we have related to transportation planning is really just to make sure that we have a forecast for uh, uh, to make sure that we're in conformity and for air quality purposes, that when we are looking at the transportation improvements that we are committing to and whether it's a regional transportation plan or a transportation improvement program, um, that those are accounting for um, uh, anticipated growth. Uh, the other facets that use this are, are anything on the, the sort of a federalized, federal uh, USDOT funded study um, that also has to use some of these same assumptions. But we hear from other folks that are curious about using this data and other processes. So that's maybe a little background on that. Yes, yeah, 
the one popped up with scenario plan, and that's definitely something that's been on our radar. Um, I don't know that we've had an idea of kind of quite what that would look like, but the the model is pretty quick to be able to to make changes at the block and zoning level. So we can we can kind of run the model through in terms of what would happen if a jurisdiction drastically changed um, allowable development in certain zoning codes. Um, those types of things we can definitely do. Um, we've also had discussions on our end about what, what would be the usefulness of coming out with high and low forecasts that were not really tied to conformity, but might be helpful for jurisdiction planning. Um, are there other levels of geography um, that could be helpful? Yeah, and we've, after the last forecast, we went through with our board and looked at how the smaller forecast um, compared with some of our aspirations of Metro Vision. And so that's something that we had a specific conversation with our board, but not necessarily with anyone else. And so, yeah, that's definitely something we're interested in um, building on and, and getting to a wider audience. Yeah, and, and a lot of this, in the past, we've been somewhat capacity constrained in what we could do that we kind of get pulled in many directions. <laughs> um, and some of our resources get um, called on to other projects, but um, we're kind of adding staff presently. Um, Corey McGinnis is on the call. He's a new um, data scientist in our group. So we're hoping that we can bring some more muscle to this and, and maybe um, do more work one-on-one -on -one with jurisdictions or with, with groups of jurisdictions. The response related to localized scenario planning, um, the, the respondent for that uh, has your jurisdiction, or if you if you feel comfortable responding, has, has your jurisdiction had a discussions on doing more local, uh, scenario planning at a local or jurisdiction level? Hey, Jeffrey, this is Sarah again. That was me. Um, you know, I. As you know, I'm really new to my um, position in Erie, um, but I think from a long range planning perspective, we're starting, we, we, no, we're not starting. We have understood the value of scenario planning. And so I think oftentimes, especially smaller jurisdictions don't necessarily have the internal resources to uh, you know, build out different scenarios or um, maybe that was Zach who was talking about the ability to sort of quickly test um, you know, maybe different policy or regulatory options. So, you know, if there was a way that this data could be, um, you know, if, if it was at a scale that was appropriate, that could be used um, to test some of that locally um, or to even look at it and, and maybe, a, again, a sub-regional um, perspective to sit, sort of help with maybe some of those lo local choices and, uh, local conversations, I think that could be helpful. Um, the, what, what I put into the mentee was not super well thought out. It just is something we've been talking a lot about here. And obviously I think a lot of communities do that as part of like a comp plan update or, or something of that nature. And then that's it, right? Um, if we kind of need to wait until a next update or, or something big happens. Um, so maybe, maybe building something that could be used in those interim years, again, to test specific proposals or, um, you know, code updates or things of that nature could be useful, but I haven't given it a ton of thought. Thank you for adding more context to that. Here. And, and what, where Erie's at relative to local uh, jurisdiction level scenario planning. And um, the top left, the first response, I guess, um, 
actually I really quickly touched on that, providing a guide about using it for certain tasks. Maybe it's more of a technical user guide um, in, in 30 seconds or less, less if, if the respondent cares to elaborate there. Um, hearing no takers, I think we'll we'll move on. I think to the final. Do we have the final slide here? Oh my goodness. Be one more slide here in interest of time. And we touched. We have certainly discussed one-on-one -on -one, meeting one-on-one -on -one with jurisdictions. So meeting with individual jurisdictions does provide a lot of value. What are topics you would like us to discuss one-on-one? -on -one? This will be the final response here before we close out the meeting. And while folks are thinking about this, I would just add the, me the mechanics of this are pretty simple. Just shoot me an email <laughs> um, and then we can set something up usually within a couple days or, or a week. This is really an area where kind of everyone be now ingrained in virtual makes this extremely easy. <laughs> um, what used to be three or four hours is now half an hour. It's, it's um, makes it much easier. I realize the open-ended questions can get taxing. This is your fifth one, and I do appreciate, we, we do appreciate the um, engagement this afternoon. And I think that first one, we're seeing two different responses um, in the in the same box. That's fine. We can um, parse that out. The first one there, land use projects in the pipeline, kind of heard a, a couple different individual responses on a previous slide allude to this uh, kind of development activity that, that's actually occurring, making sure we're reflecting that in the small year forecast. Um, perhaps the third one there, top right, um, the, the more complex questions and comments on the forecast. We had some discussion and question there, I, generally, I would say from the city of Aurora maybe, uh, kind of the sub-regional control tolls in, in that jurisdiction as a um, suggestion from Tu Ling. I'm sorry, Hua Ling. Yeah, I think these are all great reasons to meet one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I will speak to the last one, local housing trends and strength of local markets. We used to be getting updates from Zonda um, from one of their economists that were super helpful, but they've kind of restructured and that's not something we've had in a few months. Um, so we may search out some more sources of good um, local housing trends. There's definitely some interesting ones where we've compiled some things that, that could just be useful for us to make sure we've got prepped and on hand before we sit down for one of these one on ones. Like the number of national home builders active in certain areas, uh, we can get that pretty quick. Yeah, that was something we talked about last week, Andy and, and, and Zach. I hadn't thought about it, but that is a good. You know, it's it's not it's a very qualitative measure, but it's uh, uh, as opposed to you know hard 
quantitative numbers, but if you have multiple builders that are interested, then that means the market is real um, and likely to be relatively strong. And there and there can be differences if it's kind of smaller local local builders, maybe that development is likely to kind of build out smaller and quickly. If it's if you've got many national builders, they're probably going to be there for a while. So it, it, it may give some indication on the um, how large and, and how long things will take. I'll speak to uh, Zonda will provide a uh, weekly um, sales report kind of uh, pulled together at the regional scale for this market and may pull in um, Larimer County or, or um, uh, El Paso County, but um, addresses some of the number of active developments, but also um, key indicators such as uh, cancellation rates um, as well as kind of uh, percent of sales, um, those walking in the door that re end up being resulting in sales for new home builders. So, but that cancellation rate, I've been watching that uh, on the weekly reports, and it's um, gone up uh, significantly. Um, can't speak to specific numbers, but um, that is, you know, certainly in in the realm of the housing trends and and strength of the or weakness of a given mark of the market. Yeah, I would just. Um, kind of follow up on, uh, we talked about Zonda. I don't know a lot about it, but you also mentioned CoStar. And the problem with some of these um, uh, data collectors is they, they use, they, they're not necessarily using good data, and, but, but yet they're, you know, they're, uh, they're suggesting that, you know, I think a lot of people depend on CoStar, but when we look at CoStar data for the Bennett area, it's pretty bad. So you have to you have to temper and you have to add layers on on of the, that kind of local data to to make sure you're getting a really good picture. Um, but, and even even Esri data is is not very good, just because they're depending on sources that are not necessarily timely and up you know up to date. Um, great, great. Thank you, Steve, for that note of caution there for the uh, third party sources, data sources. Uh, with that, we're going to wrap up the, uh, really appreciate all the input here. Um, um, pleasantly surprised by the, all the, all the input. So I'm going to wrap up this, the Minty interactive portion and um, hand it over to Zach to close out the meeting. Thank you very much for staying a, a few extra minutes here. Oh. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I definitely want to thank everyone for the feedback um, and, and helping us kind of decide what our direction is going to be over the next um, really year or so with a lot of this feedback. Um, there are a lot of very detailed in the weeds things that we got feedback on, but more broadly, I, I'm saying that kind of across the board, I don't know whether it's that we're too deep in the weeds or we've, we're kind of myopic, but I think we're um, missing sort of that um, intro piece for how jurisdiction jurisdictions can kind of come into this process. And then we're also missing the um, feedback piece, the feedback loop that we get something for jurisdictions and that we're not then updating how that's being used. Um, so that's that's some of the areas that I, I see as kind of hopefully providing some some new resources and new products that we can develop with the working group and 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 QC and see if, if those are are helpful. And did you have any um, final comments before we wrap up today? No, I think you covered it with the big thank you. I think next steps for us are really just to try and. Uh, lay out what some of the next topics are that line up with some of our milestones really, really well. So thank you for that feedback. Um, I hope you hear from us pretty soon in the new year.
Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone.